Are you looking for wisdom, courage, and guidance on your journey as a change maker? Grab your headphones, a warm drink, and possibly a notebook. You're going to want to take notes. You found your new favorite podcast. Welcome to Become a Good Ancestor, a podcast hosted by Layla Saad. Layla is a New York Times and Sunday Times bestselling author, an international speaker, and a globally respected teacher on the topics of race, identity, leadership, personal transformation, and social change. In each episode, Layla interviews some of the world's most inspiring authors of color who are changing the world with their words. From memoirs to manifestos, poetry to pop culture, science to social justice, and everything in between. Join Layla as she dives deep with BIPOC authors who are showing us the way to healing and liberation. This is a place for people who want to help change the world in honor of those who have come before us and in service to those who will come after we are gone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode two of the brand new Become a Good Ancestor podcast. I'm your host, Leila Saad, and what an incredible month it's been bringing you this new evolution of our work. Our last episode was with Dante Stewart, who is the author of Shouting in the Fire, and we had a wonderful month reading and discussing Dante's book in the Become a Good Ancestor book club. If you haven't checked that episode out yet, I highly, highly recommend it. Today, I'm in conversation with an author that Dante is also a huge fan of. Today, for episode two, I'm speaking with writer, liturgist, and speaker, Cole Arthur Riley. If you follow Cole on Instagram, you'll know her as Black Liturgies, which is a page that she started in June 2020 and that now has more than 150,000 followers, including me. In her stunning debut, which you can see here behind me, Cole weaves stories from three generations of her family with contemplative reflections to discover the necessary rituals that connect us with our belonging, dignity and liberation. Cole studied writing at the University of Pittsburgh and currently serves as spiritual teacher in residence with Cornell University's Office of Spirituality and Meaning Making. Her debut book, which we're going to be studying today and studying also in the Become a Good Ancestor book club, is called This Here Flesh, Spirituality, Liberation and the Stories That Make Us. The book is published by Convergent Books and it's our May 2020 book selection. To find out more about the book club, make sure to join us um, by visiting becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash book club or just check the show notes. So welcome, Cole. Hi, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. We are so excited to to be having you. We're also going to just before we begin, I just want to celebrate you because your debut book is a New York Times bestseller. Oh my gosh. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm going to grab it here, actually. I'm going to grab it just so people can see it. So this is it. This here flesh. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, And I'm just, I'm really excited for you. Congratulations. Thank you. So tell people where they can find you, where they can follow you, um, just so that they can go do that now. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I have a a project called Black Liturgies, which is mostly found on Instagram at Black Liturgies. But if you want to follow me personally, you can follow me at Cole Arthur Riley um, and then at Black Liturgist anywhere else. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So let's start. Let's start with our first uh, ancestor question. Um, who are some of the ancestors living or transitioned familial or societal who have influenced you on your journey? Um, I would say, uh, I think of Toni Morrison, I think of James Baldwin, um, I think of Zora Neale Hurston and Alice Walker, and then on the kind of mystic side of things, I think of, um, Julian of Norwich, Mm. um, yeah, yeah, people like that. I love that. I love that. And we'll get a little bit more into that uh, today as we speak about um, 
your journey as a writer um, and what sort of contemplation means to you. Mm -hmm. um, but first of all, let's kind of like go back to the foundations. If you can tell us a little bit about your background, like your upbringing and mm -hmm. how you came to be a writer. Sure. So I was raised in the city, um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, by my dad and later on in life, my stepmom. But I grew up not in an overtly religious home, um, but I say that in hindsight, I think my household possessed a um, a spirituality that was rooted in things like storytelling and mm. myth and humor. Um, and I was a really, really quiet child, um, a shy child. And my dad would have us write little poems and stories to get out of chores or um, mm. if we wanted to go somewhere, like if we wanted to go to the park with our friends, it was like, okay, do you want to vacuum or do you want to write a poem? And then like, that was like almost payment. Um, in a way, sometimes <laughs> he would just pay us to write stories. And so I think, uh, thankfully, my father from a very young age recognized that I needed some kind of tool for expression um, because I was so quiet and I really took to writing. Yeah. Mm. What were some of the first things that you remember writing? Um, you know, I would write very, <laughs> my family jokes about this now. I would write very, um, dramatic stories <laughs> for a child. Mm. So my first short story was called Blood and Cinnamon. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it's so funny in hindsight. Like I would write these very dramatic, you know, short stories, uh, that were just kind of funny, but I would also write poems. So my dad would, mm. you know, give me and my siblings like a color. And then we, he would time us and say like, okay, 10 minutes, everyone write a poem on yellow or ever like, or just give us a mm. word or something. So I remember poetry. I remember writing poetry before I ever read it. Um, yeah. So I'm not even really sure where I kind of yeah, gain the understanding of what a poem even is, honestly. But yeah, um, yeah, that is so beautiful. And, I, and it sounds like, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I also journaled a lot, mm. um, lots of diary entries from young yeah. Cole. Mm -hmm. I love that. It sounds like it was a be really beautiful and rich environment to um, to grow up in with um, such affirmation and encouragement for creative uh, self-expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. And I've been talking to my dad uh, about this some since the book came out because, you know, he's not a reader. My stepmom's not a reader. They're not writers. Oh, funny. Um, yeah. So people sometimes think I came from this very, like, literary family. My grandma right, was right. a writer. Um, but they weren't. And so it, it's just interesting that he kind of intuited that that was where my voice would kind of come through. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that so much. So you you started, you you, you talked about you're the, the creator and, and writer behind Black Liturgies, um, which is a project seeking to integrate different concepts like dignity and lament and rage and rest and liberation, um, along with literature and spirituality. Um, can you, for those of us not in the know, can you explain what liturgy is mm -hmm. and how you came to create this project? Because it sounds like, you know, it it's it's always easy to like look back in hindsight, like, oh yeah, Chloe was always writing. This is like such a natural thing for her to do next. But I wonder if you can kind of um, uh, thread the needle for us to get us to how, how did you get to starting this project? So what is liturgy and how did you create this project? Sure. Um, so liturgy, it comes from a, a Greek word that essentially means work of the people. And if it, if you encounter it, it's usually um, like a form or a, yeah, a form for a religious ceremony or service, a form for kind of connecting with the divine. So if you've been to Catholic mass or an, Anglo, an Anglican rite or something like that, you have probably experienced some kind of liturgy. But um, I, I, I think kind of at its core, it's a way mm. of kind of the collective 
communicating with the spiritual or conveying the spiritual a way of conveying that part of the human experience I think I um I I, I recently had the thought that um like liturgists are kind of the artists of the spiritual you know um mm. it's not really about it's not really about conveying or, or teaching it's not really about teaching a doctrine or a creed or anything like that it's about you know what does it mean to be human you know how how do I express this feeling or how do I express this desire um in the presence of the spiritual or with awareness to the spiritual yeah mm. and and what in what form was that were you doing that work before creating um the 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 sort of work that we see what and what led to you wanting to create it as this wonderful right. page um yeah so i had i had encountered liturgy i was working for this um episcopal church after college and that was my first encounter with kind of the book of common prayer and i found a lot of beauty in it um and a lot of rest you know to not have to always know what to say and mm. but it, it in the summer of 2020, which is when I started Black Liturgies, I was f just experiencing this disconnect between my Blackness in, and kind of the liturgy I was encountering on mm. Sundays. Or And just, I've said this before, but I just think there are seasons where it's just really difficult to pray words written by a white man. And, um, mm. and knowing that, you know, he didn't care about me or my blackness, you know, Thomas Cranmer <laughs> in mm -hmm. the 16th century, I think, you know, when the transatlantic slave trade was picking up, like he didn't care about me when he was writing his words. So, mm -hmm. you know, as the world was kind of finally prepared to pay attention, at least for a little bit to um, the murder of black people at the hands of mm. white people, um, I was just in one of those seasons and looking for a space that could hold um, Black grief, could hold the Black embodied experience, you know, could hold Black emotion, um, yeah, in a, in a spiritual context. So mm. I, I started Black liturgies mostly out of anger, <laughs> maybe a little bit of resentment because I, I've, I felt this kind of chasm between me and the liturgical spaces I was a part of. Mm. How have you seen and felt it evolve um, since then? Because that was a really high emotional uh, time collectively. Yes. Um, how have you how have you felt it evolve and how have you felt yourself evolve over these last mm. two years? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I, I, well, first of all, I thought it was going to be this really kind of small, intimate thing, which I, I wasn't really involved on social media that much before Black Liturgy. Oh, wow. So people were like, then why did you choose Instagram, you know, as a way to <laughs> like, like uh -huh. post about this? And I'm like, honestly, I just wasn't really thinking about the nature of Instagram. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I I thought it would be kind of this small group. I, I just didn't think... In hindsight, I can understand its appeal and why people really took to it. But in the moment, I yeah. was just so um, isolated from spiritual spaces that I didn't really have an imagination for it being much more than like a dozen or 20 of us. Um, mm. So I've seen it it grow. I've seen as it grow, it um, gain the attention of a lot of white people as well, which is an mm. interesting evolution at around 10,000 followers, I just noticed mm. this kind of flip switch and all of a sudden, you know, lots of white people were following me. And um, so I had to maybe work a little harder at figuring out what the white gaze is doing and mm. what kind of temptations come with it, you know, yeah. what kind of, um, yeah, what kind of motivations come with it or come awake in me and uh, so mm -hmm. now I feel maybe it takes a little more time for me to post because I have to interrogate it. Like, you know, who am I, Absolutely. who am I speaking to and who am I catering to? And um, yeah, it, it makes my work a bit difficult, but um, it also, yeah, I, I, I think there can be a certain beauty in it if, you know, for the, 
the rare white person who's capable of decentering themselves <laughs> in the space. Yeah. I think it can be quite beautiful yeah. to to you know you know pray or hold words written by a black woman. But yeah. Uh, no, that's so that's so real. You shared about um, Toni Morrison being one of your um, good ancestors who have influenced you. And, you know, she wrote and spoke and taught so much about this. And I, I definitely resonate with what you said around like kind of doing a deeper interrogation before you write anything, before you publish mm -hmm. anything. Like, who is this for? What am I trying to um, achieve with this? Um, I don't know if you experienced this, but I went through kind of almost like feeling like I was running around in my mind, like, is this for me? Do I even know what I, you know what I mean? Do I know who yes. I am outside mm -hmm. of this gaze? Um, has that been something you've experienced? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Because you know what? Something that I thought the other day is like the white gaze, it pays, you know? It 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 mm -hmm. it, 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 it pays. It 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 um mm -hmm. the white gaze makes a post go viral, you know? It's really mm -hmm. sinister because you know that you're mm -hmm. sacrificing a part of you afterwards, you can kind of mm -hmm. realize that. Um but in the moment you think you're writing something for the people, but really you're writing like what will go far, you know, what will yeah, resonate yeah, yeah. with the most people. And I, I, and I think it's, yeah, I think we just, I, I wish there was more space to talk about like the temptation of the white gaze of man, like the money that comes yeah. with the white gaze on your work. Right. And, and so I, I have had to ask myself, even looking, you know, sometimes the, I think the white gaze has won in my work um mm. in black liturgies and I'm like man I, I I wish I I wish I could go back but I, I mean that's just a part of it and becoming more yeah. and more aware of like yeah. you know the I, I'm for example I'm prone to appealing to kind of white intellectual um men hated in myself but I I mean even as I was writing this here flesh I had to keep asking myself you know like who's in the room with you Cole like is, right. it, is it is it your ancestors? Is it is it is is it you know the people that made yeah. you, or is it this random white intellectual that you wanted and em embraced by when you were you know in your teens to early twenties? Um, and mm. so I, I, I I'm hoping as I age, it will become easier and easier to like kind of untangle those things, yeah. you know, more quickly. But right now, it's it takes effort. Yeah. It's hard. And it just speaks to, for so many of us, whether you're a writer, a poet, like anything, any person who is a, who's a creator who puts things out for, um, public, uh, you know, consumption and public, uh, good. It's like, this is, if you're a black person or an indigenous, a person of color, there's several <laughs> things that have to happen before you feel comfortable putting something out. And even when you do, you're like, was it this, was it that? Um, mm -hmm. and that's just a, such a privilege to not have to think about those things. Mm -hmm. Um, there's so much energy that is taken up with that, but I think it's also very, I think it's what gives, our work such depth though at the same time that it um it's very considered it's very considered mm -hmm. and um I felt and I'd love to talk about your book now I mean with your book so this here flesh which is beautiful New York Times bestseller um <laughs> that it it's a very I've never read anything like it before and I don't know what I was expecting because obviously I follow you on Instagram and with any social media account, the information is in very like digestible chunks mm -hmm. and you're trying to convey wisdom in like a very short, you know, frame, you know what I mean? Yes. Whereas mm -hmm. with the book, you can really share and you can really experiment. And what I loved about your book is that it was such an ex experimental way of writing. It wasn't a clear A to Z narrative. It also wasn't just purely meditative, meditative or poetic. It was like everything all at once. Mm -hmm. And it made me pause at several points along the way to just have to sit and digest what it was that you were saying, not from an intellectual point of view, um, from a very, like how it landed in my body. That's what, mm. that's what it felt like. It was, what does this feel like? Um, so could you tell our listeners, um, and our viewers, what is this, what is this here flesh? What is the book? Why this title? What does it mean to you? 
Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, it is. It's very different than Black liturgies, isn't it? Uh, it's grounded. The chapters are kind it of is, grounded. It is. Yes. Yeah. It's grounded in the things that Black liturgies is kind of grounded on, like the chapter titles. But in itself, I think I wanted, mm. I just wanted to be true to myself as a writer. And like, you know, I was a writer before I was a liturgist. I was interested in kind of creative writing before I was a liturgist. And I wanted to make sure I wasn't bound by like the singular project in my life that was almost incidental, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and mm-hmm, so I'm like, I just, mm-hmm. I'm just going to write like, like me, you know? And it's, I, I, I think I, um, there's definitely something queer about my work that I wanted to preserve. And, um, yeah. but also I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I thought I was going to write this like really just kind of dense, con- spiritual, contemplative book <laughs> like Thomas Merton or something, but for Black people. And as I started it, I'm like, there is just, there's no such thing because I think mm. Black contemplation is so distinct. And I started mm. to go back to kind of the spirituality of my household. Um, and like I said, it being about storytelling and, and myth, like we love to make up story, like just make up things and pass them on to like poor kids. And so I, I wanted that to be in my writing. Um, and I'd been interviewing my like different people in my family, different older people in my family for a few, s- several years at that point. Um, and I'd started with my father and my grandma and their stories and kind of the interplay between our three stories was just really present in me when I started mm. to write. And so I, I, I I made this kind of decision at post proposal of like, I'm only, I'm just going to focus on, you know, our three stories so that I can try my best to write a really complicated, nuanced people, you know? Mm. Um, and, and I, I, I knew that I needed to kind of hone in on just a, a few of us and that the three generations in, in my family. So um, if you haven't read this here, Flesh, it's, you know, there's spiritual contemplation on things like dignity and lament and rage and rest, but then there's it's also interspersed with a lot of um, storytelling and a little bit of myth mm. as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, you were just sort of touching on like the 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 publishing uh, aspect of this. Um, I'm I'm guessing you know like with me and white supremacy, for example, what really made publishers want to publish is the fact that this was such a beautiful movement that you were creating on Instagram um, and that people were really um, engaged with your work and that people really had a, a hunger and an appetite for it. Do you think that either you knew or your publishers knew that what the book would become wouldn't just be the Instagram page as a book. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think my publisher really knew. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I think you know, I'd written a sample chapter and they had had really liked it, but um, I think I'd even kind of held back in that because I was unsure how welcomed, you know, my like truest literary voice would be. Um, I wasn't sure, you know, if they would want it to look closer to Black liturgies. And I was really grateful to be yeah. paired with editors who really got it, who really, who really understand me as a writer and understand that, you know, I'm I'm hoping to have a long literary career. And to do that, I mm-hmm. just have to be honest with, you know, my own voice on the page. And so, yeah, yeah. but I don't think they knew. I think, they, <laughs> I think... I kind of knew I would try, but I didn't know how far I would take it and how far they would let me take it, you know, just literally putting myth and magic realism into this book. I just didn't, yeah, didn't know how much of it they would take to. Was there a point at which you were writing the book that you felt like that truest self felt like she could finally be her truest self like was there a point at which you gave yourself full permission to go in or was it just an unfolding journey I think it was just unfolding but I I will say I do think I quickly realized that that comes across for me best in storytelling not in Mm. the the actual kind of reflections afterwards um 
I think th- th- I'm I'm really interested in kind of um, not not I, I'm interested in talking about lament but I'm much more interested in like describing you know um telling the story of my grandma you know on the linoleum floor and yeah. honoring that moment in her and you know honoring the way her her body was contorted and I, I'm I'm interested in kind of con- mm. conveying those things and storytelling mm. and so I feel like you know when I I, I haven't really reread the book apart from editing, but mm-hmm. while I was um, doing the audio book, I could sense that the parts where I was reading the stories, um, I just mm. felt something different in me, something different awake in me. So. Yeah. Talking about the stories, um, tell us about the stories. You said you so the book is covers three generations of stories your own your father's um your grandmother's um what was the process like for you of gathering their stories and what was it that you wanted to make sure that you got across as a kind of faithful narrator of their dignity yes so I mentioned that I had been interviewing them interviewing people in my family and uh, I, I mm. um I don't know if you've done done this, with, but I, I think there's something, there's some kind of resistance in, I think, people to talk about stories with particularity, you know, like talk about mm. really mm. small stories, for lack of a better word. Um, and there's something in us, maybe, yeah, there's something in us that kind of wants to expedite things and talk about like grand sweeping narratives in our lives. Um, right. as opposed yes. to these very specific kind of almost fragments. And um, yeah, I've learned a lot from people who have said, you know, it's the fragments. It's the the very particular that is actually most transcendent, which is actually most moving, and at least for me. And so, you know, I interviewed them, but that's a very easy way to put it because it was actually this like labor of drawing out these details that they weren't used to people waiting for honestly I think some of it is like are you do you really want to know do you really care what I was wearing Mm. do you really care the like what my hands were doing you know or what my face looked like and like convincing them I do (laughs) like I I I do if you feel (laughs) safe like take me there like take me to these spaces Mm. so I had to I, I came up with some while I, w- I had some stories in mind from the interviews, but while I was writing, I would call them, especially my grandma, usually on Saturdays, and I would have these, like, a list of questions that, you know, to try to draw out the particularity more, um, yeah, which was always quite the task, <laughs> but worth mm. it. <laughs> what can you tell us um one of your favorite stories from your from your grandmother or just one of the stories that it ha- was most impactful for you hmm. yeah you know I think about this moment um this is kind of a moment where our stories merge and I'm visiting her in the hospital this is in the chapter on repair and mm. you know, and she's it's 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 a really kind of meta moment because I I added this during the editing process, not in the initial writing. Um, but I'm visiting her in the hospital, you know, um, this past summer, so in July, and um, she had just been in a coma, medically induced coma, for five days, which if any of your listeners know that like usually takes a lot to recover so I went thinking Mm. I was saying goodbye um and prepared to read her some of the book because she hadn't read any of it but when I got got there she was speaking she was kind of out of it but still coherent enough and she was talking about the stories that were in the book and going using using I and we and they like interchangeably probably because of the medication she was on. And so I didn't know if she was talking about my story or she was talking about hers, which I think is really beautiful Mm. in hindsight. And Mm. then she just pauses after talking about some traumatic um, memories that are in the book. She pauses and she says, uh, we did good. We did good. Mm. We took the sweetest part of the fruit and we cut it off. And I was like, I just had chills. And I, I left the hospital room and I looked at my, 
my husband and I was like, wow. did you hear that? Did she? <laughs> like, and we Googled mm. it because we thought surely she didn't just come up with it this It sounds beautiful, like poetry, right? Exactly. Like, I'm like, surely she didn't just come up with this beautiful line. And she really did. That just was in her somewhere. And that, um, wow. yeah, that memory of, of her kind of connecting each of our stories without even being fully lucid. And that be- we took the sweetest mm. part of the fruit and we cut it off. Oh, I'll never, I'll never forget that. That is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. Dear good ancestors, let's take a short break for a minute. Are you enjoying this episode? Then you should join our book club. The Become a Good Ancestor book club is a place for book loving change makers. We are a community of engaged people from around the world who are passionate about social justice, creativity, leadership, healing, liberation, and of course, books. Each month on Patreon, we read and discuss the book from the current month's episode, and at the end of the month, we host an exclusive Q&A event with the author themselves. Our past books and authors include the New York Times bestseller The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr., Motherhood on the Choices of Being a Woman by Dr. Praya Agrawal, The Final Revival of Opal and Nev by Donnie Walton, named a Best Book of 2021 by Barack Obama, and See No Stranger, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love by renowned civil rights leader Valerie Carr. The internet can often be a loud and overwhelming place. There's a lot of information out there, but not always a lot of depth. When you join our book club, you'll become a member of a thoughtful and hopeful corner of the internet. To learn more, click the link in the show notes or visit becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash book club. We can't wait to see you there. You um, you write in the preface of your book, um, you say, I'm interested in reclaiming a contemplation that is not exclusive to whiteness, intellectualism, ableism, or mere hobby. And as a black woman, I am disinterested in any call to spirituality that divorces my mind from my body, voice, or people. Yes. Um, What is contemplation? And what does it mean to live a contemplative life um, as you have just described it, free of all of those isms? Mm -hmm. Yes. To me, I think it's, um, it's partially paying attention to your own interior Mm. world. And it's also part paying attention to, you know, the exterior and kind of bridging the exterior and the interior and becoming honest. And, um, I think I had been in spaces where I was, you know, where contemplation was equated with intellect Mm. and just this complete practice of the mind. And, um, I, yeah, I, I'm very skeptical of that. I was skeptical of that then. And, um, started to try to put words to why and started to try to ask myself the question is like, is there room for blackness in contemplation really um, if it's this disembodied pursuit? Because I don't want a disembodied spirituality. I don't want a disembodied spiritual practice. Um, so is there, is, is this really a safe kind of path to the divine for me? And Toni Morrison, in the site of memory, she talks about um, – this practice of imagination that she started to do for her ancestors who were enslaved. Mm. And um, she was writing in a time where there were increasing narratives um, about people who were her people who were enslaved, but not many that really translated a rich interior life for enslaved people. And so she talks about this practice of imagination. And, and she says, you know, they are my entrance. They are my entrance to my own interior world, which is so beautiful beautiful. and so appropriate for this podcast, actually. I hadn't thought about that (laughs) until until I started speaking. She says, they are my entrance to my own interior world. I thought, okay, so there's something intergenerational about Black contemplation. And then, you know, you you asked about the book title and I, I forgot to answer, but this is a perfect moment. So 
the title, This Here Flesh, is a nod to this scene uh, in Beloved or this mm. location the setting oh my gosh. of the clearing. Yeah, I'm getting chills because I'm remembering yes. in your book when you spoke about this. And I love that book. So, yes, yes. sorry, continue. I, <laughs> yeah. Do. No, it's mm-hmm. okay. I'm glad that you love mm-hmm. it because I think like that's the kind of. So, the clearing, Toni Morrison takes us to this yeah. clearing and it's this kind of harbor for. For Black people and, you know, um, this matriarch of the family, Baby Suggs, for those of you who haven't read it, she's, you know, says, you know, children come to come to the center and calls them to the center of the clearing and, you know, says, let your mo- let your mothers hear you laugh and they laugh and then she calls the the men, let your let your wife see you dance um, and they dance and then she calls the, the woman and then to the center and she says, cry mm. for the living and the dead, just cry. And um, and they do, and and she talks about you know them all getting kind of tangled up in each other until the the women are laughing and the children are dancing and the men are crying, and they collapse in the in the clearing together, and 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 then baby Suggs gives her sermon in this here place we flesh flesh that weeps laughs flesh that dances on bare feet and grass love it, um, and so she gives this beautiful uh kind of message to the people about loving the body Mm. after leading them in this kind of sacred practice of liberation in the body. And so I I wrote that preface and I thought, okay, this is the spirituality that I, if I'm, if I'm going to do this, I want to communicate this kind of contemplation, Mm. this kind of spirituality, one that's intergenerational, Mm. one that's embodied, one that's emotional, you know, um, yeah. I love that so much. That was a long answer. No, I love it. I love it. it and it was, um, that was one of my favorite parts of, of your book because it reminded me of that scene from 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 that story um, and just how, um, how I don't even, it, there, it's hard to even find the words of what it was like to kind of picture that scene as Toni Morrison describes it um, in the book and the healing really, truly that comes from an embodied, mm-hmm. um, an embodied spirituality. And it's got me thinking about various different things, just as we're having this conversation, both that scene and your, um, your work and your writing. Um, you know, I remember a few years ago, I was studying feminine spirituality and studying about various different mystics and they, they their spirituality was a real embodied spirituality that from the lens of white patriarchal capitalistic sort of intellectualism is this person has lost their mind, right? This person um, mm-hmm. isn't isn't a, a authority to speak on um, spirituality because they're not speaking from logic and they're not speaking from rationality and they are not sort of um, in a state of suffering and um, and uh, yeah, just like being filled with guilt and shame, they're actually enraptured. They're 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 in rapture. Um, mm-hmm. And that's what I remember from reading that scene in, in Beloved and how I feel about your work as well is that there is, there is space for both the thinking, but there is deep, deep, deep space for both like the embodied experience. And, you know, the fact that your work as we know it, right. The, the, the you that we know now, not the you that you've been your entire life, but the rest of us know you, is that you introduced us mm-hmm. to, and you created for us a space in which, within the turmoil and chaos of everything that we saw from 2020 onwards, that the space that you've created is it is a space of safety and rest, but also mm-hmm. of reminding us to tune back inwards to ourselves like you use on your Instagram posts like on the carousel there'll always be like an inhale affirmation and an exhale affirmation Mm -hmm. you're connecting us to our breath so speak to us about that more um really understanding like what does it mean to embody to to be embodied in your spirituality and in your experience of of humanity Mm. yeah so I'm I'm I've always been a um a person at risk for disembodiment. I, I, I've been a 
like since I was little, like lived in my mind mostly. And, um, and so it's been a real journey, I think for me to like befriend my body. Um, I was a, this is more, a more story-based answer, but I was a dancer and that was my one, I, I did ballet and that was my one kind of connection to my own body to my own flesh and apart from that I would just live in kind of the clouds Mm. or um live in live in my mind and kind of just keep my shoulders Mm -hmm. up and very tense child um but dance was this one kind of avenue to my body where I started to understand its strength and its power its capacity for beauty and, and making beauty um and at the same time, ballet is very white, right. um, dominated yeah. space. And so it's, you know, kind of the beginnings of me turning against my body. Mm. And um, I, I lived with bulimia for a little over a decade and in the time that I was a dancer. And so I I think I've always, my, my story has always been connected to, you know, um, this question of like, cool, art are you going to stay whole? Are you going to, are you going to do this? Are you going to try to integrate yourself? Try to care, try to nourish your body in the same way that you're obsessed with nourishing your Mm. mind? You know, is that, does that, does that matter to you? I think from a young, young age, that's kind of been my journey later on in life, developed chronic illness. Mm. um, The book talks about, and I think through chronic illness, I've had to, really become honest about my self-hatred with my body because frankly the disabled community the chronically ill community like you you can't afford not Mm. to you can't afford Mm -hmm. to to not pay attention to your body Mm -hmm. it comes at such a great cost and so through that is where I really started to think about a spirituality that was fully embodied uh um you know I was asking questions of what does it mean to love and what does it mean to grieve and these kind of these 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 mental questions as opposed to you know um what does it mean to eat right what does it mean to what is it what does it mean to play and you know I I I I I tried to start incorporating some of those questions as well and when I think about my ancestors who were enslaved and who had so many limitations placed on on the body it's very difficult for me to conceive of a liberation that doesn't all also um, liberate the body, that doesn't also connect us to um, deep care and tenderness for the body when many of the people that formed me were, their bodies were neglected and, and used as capital. And, you know, um, someone asked me recently, you know, like, what happens when you're, when you live disembodied? And I said, someone else is going to use your mm. body. That's what happens. You know, it's not this neutral emptiness. It's not a vacancy. Right. If you're not paying attention to your body, let, let, like, let me tell you, capitalism yeah. is, yeah. you know, whiteness yeah. is. Um, and so if, if, you're, if you're not in your body, someone else is. Someone else is at the home. And I, wow. I feel like um, I need to kind of remind myself, I need to communicate a kind of spirituality in Black liturgies and otherwise that kind of resist that you know wow that is just like you just give you give me everything I needed in just that (laughs) in just that that last 20 seconds um (laughs) because I've never heard it put that way but you're so so right um we can't afford not to be embodied somebody else is always looking right it's like Audre Lorde said if I if Mm -hmm. if you don't define yourself for yourself then somebody else will do it for you and usually it will be for their gain and to your detriment. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, For those of us, because I'm with you, I'm definitely a mind person more than a body person. I am that... I'm that kid and now that adult that always has their head in a book, always learning something, always journaling, have to write all my thoughts out, like uh, everything, you know, Um, embodiment Mm -hmm. and being connected with my body's needs and wants has to be some, it's not something that comes natural. It's something that I actually have to like schedule in. You know what I mean? Like I have to write it mm-hmm. down. Like I'm, <laughs> yes, I know exactly. Uh-huh. What you mean. So what are what kindred, are, <laughs> kindred spirits? What are some practices um, uh, that you that you do? Um, what are some things that you write down? What are some mm-hmm. things that you try to integrate into your life? 
Mm-hmm. Well, this one's really specific, but the first that came to mind, um, I talk about in my book, I have a, a number of eye conditions, mm. um, my retinas and other things. And, um, but I'm also a writer mm-hmm. and there, um, I can't just stare at, but because I'm so, you know, I'm prone to disembodiment, I, I'll stare at a screen for, you know, four hours while I'm writing right. and not look away because my body doesn't remember, it doesn't tell itself like, cool, you're at, you're hurting mm. until a- after. Mm-hmm. And so I've started to set alarms mm. um, every 15 minutes. I, this, people are going to be like, this is wild. This is amazing. <laughs> I like, no, I, truly I set love an it. Alarm every 15 minutes so, so that I remember to like stare out the window mm. for, you know, a few minutes and then get back to yeah. it. If I don't, I'll just, I'll lose myself. I'll lose, I'll lose my body. Um, <clears throat> but also I, I'm in a, a household. I'm in a, I'm in a family, thankfully that, um, you know, is, is really aware of like, I'll forget to eat until 7 PM right. and, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. You know, I'll just like look up and there's a bowl of grapes mm. or pistachios next to me, which I understand is a very lucky kind of dynamic, but I've also, I can't, you know, do ballet like I used to because of my health, but I've learned, you know, to stretch. Yeah. I've learned to incorporate, like, I, I I incorporate my body as I'm writing. Like, I don't want to write about my dad folding a piece of paper without, you know, mm. I'll, I'll do the mm-hmm. motion. And, and I actually think that makes me a better mm. writer when I actually, pro- I'm like, what, what are my hands actually doing? As opposed to imagining it in my right. mind or... Um, rolling <laughs> rolling a joint I was like what are my <laughs> hands doing and trying to figure out like okay how do I you know describe this outside of my mind and in my body I think it has made my writing better yeah. but um yeah I'm like you it's it's it, it requires a lot of a lot of effort yeah. and um yeah. I love that. I love that you gave us something that was just really simple as well, because I think sometimes we tend to overthink um, things like it has to be this mm-hmm. whole orchestration. But actually, it's like, you know, this yes. is this is this would help like setting an alarm to go off every 15 minutes would actually really help me through the course of the day so that by the end of the day, I'm not in complete mm-hmm. and utter pain um, because I stared at the screen for hours because I can do that. I'm I'm the same. I'm like, yes. once I get in the zone, like I'm not stepping out of the zone, you know, <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have I, I have um, yeah. I have a morning practice called three M's. And so it's um, uh so it's part like for my mind, part for my body, part for my soul. So it's the first M is my morning pages. So I write like three. Uh, this is from Julia Cameron's um, The Artist's Way. So three pages of uh, freehand writing just to get anything out that wants to come out. Um, and then movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be any any kind of movement. And I tend to... I will just see how, like, I might have a goal of like, I want to do three days of this kind of movement and th- and two days of this kind of movement. But I also really check in with myself every day and like, do I actually feel like doing that today or do I just want to stretch, you know? Um, and then my last M is, is meditation. And I'm trying more and more to find meditations that allow me to connect to my body as well. Um, uh, so mm-hmm. that I'm not, it's not just about like, oh yes, the mind and what the mind can do, but really like how do different mm-hmm. parts of my body feel? And I find that that like simple, like three M's, okay, done. And I'll write each one of them down, but they're done, you know, um, just keeping it simple, I think really I helps. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I love that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm not Christian, I'm Muslim. Um, but I found deep meaning and comfort and um, yeah, liberation from reading your words and from following you. Um, would you say that uh, contemplation, liturgy, all of that isn't just something that is restricted to kind of one religious framework, that it kind of includes everything, uh-huh. but sort of transcends everything as well? Yeah. I do. I do think that. And I think it because, and simply because it's not primarily focused with, you know, teaching or education, yes. but about, you know, conveying the human experience. I think, you know, I, I'm I'm operating out of a Christian formation, but I think it 
is is in many many spiritualities this kind of um, form for connecting with the divine this kind of ceremony and it might be called something different I'm not tied to it calling being called mm. liturgy but I think really you know if if there if it's some kind of collective practice you know that you feel like is leading you toward the divine mm. and and you're able to do it with some level of ritual mm. I would say mm. yeah that's a, that's a that's a, a liturgy and I don't think it's you know it's the most in you know there are people there are liturgists uh, apologists out there who think it's like the most important thing or like the the necessity I actually don't think it's a necessity mm. um I just think for some of us, that's a really helpful way for us to experience the divine, to to remember, you know, that we are spiritual beings, right. to have this kind of collective, especially, I mean, for solitary people, for um, disembodied people, you know, I think it's a, a really compelling form, mm. you know. What does, um, I'm wondering what communal... What does this work like? It, it look like it, it, in a, is a community. I think it it really speaks to me as someone who, like you, is very self reflective, very like self referential, and really um, uh, is very connected with like my own personal relationship with God or the divine or whatever you want to call that presence. Um, mm -hmm. But what does this work look like as a community? Mm -hmm. You know, I think. Um there's something to it that's maybe a, like a kind of solidarity that's really special in community. And and what I mean is like when you're when you're practicing a liturgy or when you're reading words or engaging in a practice, like a shared practice, um, you know, it's not going to resonate with yeah. everyone. And the word, like, for example, Black liturgies, like, you might read something and it might not resonate with you at all, you know. Um, it might, you might not even understand what it's really talking about. I did a liturgy on perfectionism and someone DM'd me like, oh, that's not my experience. Mm. And I said, it doesn't have mm. to be, you know. I think part of the beauty in it is, in it is even if it doesn't center me, I'm capable of remaining in the space, I'm capable of having an imagination for another person's lived experiences and um, and staying, you know, even if it's not about me. So I, I think it can be a kind of, you know, beautiful form of solidarity and I community and, and mutuality, you know, not always focusing on one person's experience. Yeah. I love that because it's not like, as you were saying, it's not about the specific doc doctrine. It's not about following specific rules or a specific uh, framework um, that says in order to belong here, this is what you have to believe or this is how you have to behave. But really that solidarity, mm -hmm. I love that you use that word, that solidarity um, of honoring all of our individual unique experiences and perspectives um, while also... Yes really owning our own right not not comparing right mm -hmm. like not saying oh yours has to be like mine yes. or mine has to be like yours but really where are the points that we meet mm -hmm. like some of the words that you use to describe your words like rage like lament like dignity love right these are human experiences these transcend any mm -hmm any frameworks any kind of formalized anything this is our yes. experiences as human beings Mm -hmm, exactly. And when I wrote this here, Flesh, I really tried to be careful, you know, uh, careful to have it feel ex like, like expansive mm. as opposed to, you know, narrowing. Yeah. And so it's like, it might be it might be unsatisfying for some people because I'm very rarely, you know, answering a question, <laughs> usually just asking it. And I, I had to try to be really careful with how I used um the, the the Christian the the, the biblical texts yes. to not um, use them in the same manner that they are sometimes used in um, Christian nonfiction to to say you know this, this is, is what it is this is what right. happened as opposed to yes this is this is um, a story I found meaning mm. in is 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 kind of how I tried to approach it as this story based experience even of those you know occasions where I talk about the um, the, the the Bible because I wanted it to feel like this ex ex yeah. this expanding you know this like true sp spiritual liberation which like you said doesn't demand um, 
doesn't doesn't demand a particular belief in order to belong. There's nothing wrong with particularized yes. belief, but it's not predicated mm-hmm. on that in order to belong. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely not prescriptive. Mm-hmm. I love what you said about like actually ask more questions and give more answers because I think that that was what made it feel like this is a beautiful it, it was it felt like it feels like reading you in process as opposed to this is the journey that yes. I've been on and this is the end at which I've now reached, <laughs> right? It's like, no, this is me on pro- in process. This mm-hmm. is me in the journey. This is me as a human being. Um, and so to that end, I'm wondering, what is it that you hope that this book will do in the world? How do you hope it will um, help people um, what it you know? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but kind of what is what is it that you hope that it will do for people, or what people will do with it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope that I, I hope that I give people an imagination for preserving our stories, mm. for preserving you know the the stories that came before us, for being our our own historians in a way, our own familial historians. I think that is really the kind of like most special part of the work that came alive in me is like, oh, I feel like such this, like this responsibility, this sacred responsibility as a caretaker of story um, in in awareness that that's how we're formed, that that's, that we're formed by those things. So I hope that storytelling, story exchange, um, and also I hope I give people, um, yeah, this, this picture of what it means to be a spiritual person that also, um, like you said, is in process, that that isn't so certain, that isn't so mm. sure, that it's more about um, experience than it is about knowledge. And um, that contains a lot of mystery, honestly. Um, that contains a lot of mystery and wonder. I, I, I want that for more people. I don't mean to sound like, I don't know, I don't mean to sound... Um, yeah, arrogant or anything like that. But I, I feel like I've really found yeah. something in that, in that freedom, in that liberation. I want that for other Absolutely. people. Absolutely. You know, um, I mean, what you've just spoken to is a huge reason why I wanted to be able to speak with you on the podcast and why we definitely wanted to be reading this book um, in, in the book club. Um, because what we're hoping to do is to give people tools, stories, narratives, um, uh, encouragement, um, you know, what you name it, um, on their journeys, um, and uh, on our collective journeys is trying to become good ancestors, really trying to honor those who've come before us, really trying to be of service to those who'll come after we're gone, really trying to live the depth and breadth of our human experience now in the present. And I felt that what you really, um, and this is why it's it's no surprise that this book has done so well is that what you've really given us is a is a book and a um I don't think framework is not the right word but a kind of a perspective that allows us to really dance it's 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 more of a dance rather than a step 1 step 2 step 3 um a, a dance of like what are what is arising within me as we experience such tumult and such chaos and so much fear and separation and all of those things in the world as we have it today? And where are the places where I can find connection and belonging and um, truth, Mm -hmm. you know, my truth, our truth um, together? Um, the, the, The journey really is so much of it is mystery. I'm so glad you used that word. So much of it is mystery. Mm-hmm. And that can feel like, what does that mean? You know, like, I want, I want the answers, Cole, like, tell me what to do, Cole, right? But it's like, <laughs> no, that's not what it that's, that's just not, um, we're not robots. We're not items that have been created mm-hmm. out of a factory. We are human beings, we're embodied flesh, right? But we're also, um, we're also mm-hmm. a lot more than that as well. And it's all together and it's all divine. And so that's why I wanted to be able to speak with you and, and to bring this book into the book club. So mm-hmm. I am so excited to be, um, uh, that we'll be reading this through the month of, of May. Um, I know that people will come out of it the other side, both feeling that they have answers and that they probably have more questions as well, but that those questions are mm-hmm. the questions that they will live into as opposed to, just feeling stuck. Um, so I, I think it's beautiful yes. what you've done and thank you so much. 
Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for inviting absolutely. me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So our final mm-hmm. question, Cole, what does it mean to you to become a good ancestor? Mm. Um, to me, to to become a good ancestor is to um to keep the memory, to 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 be a, a keeper of memory, a curator of collective memory, um, so that the people who come after me aren't aren't lost. Mm aren't too far. Yeah. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. Do you typically answer this No, question? I don't. Are you posing it back it to me? To oh my goodness. I mean, I would love to know. You've been doing this for long enough. The interviewee <laughs> becomes the interviewer. Um, it is, it's a question. It's a mystery. It's a question that is continuously evolving for me um, because at different points of my life, it looks like different things. And for different spheres of my life, it looks for different things. Mm-hmm. It looks like different things. But I think in whole, in, in whole kind of from a bird's eye perspective, it's really for me situating myself in the present timeline and really wanting to, to do to be of to to honor mm-hmm. those who came before me those who poured into me those who survived so that I could be here those who sacrificed those who um also took risks right and and who and who tried and and so to to really honor them and also then to 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 live my life now to live my life now as the fullest most truest and expression Mm -hmm. of myself so that it may be an example to others um, who come after I'm gone, not as this perfect role model, but really as a full human being um, who is trying, who is failing, who is figuring it out, who's who's trying to figure out how to be less in her mind and more in her body, um, who's experimenting and um, and 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 finding ways to to really express herself uh i feel like it's a it, it's i think i feel like it's the purpose of my life mm. um it is so much more than the kind of podcast the brand the everything yes. it's like this is this is me layla this is what i'm here to do um and it's a question that every day when i sit down to journal you know i'm thinking about i'm thinking about yes. it yeah that's so beautiful that's so beautiful thank you it really is can tell you've been thinking about Thank it. Thank you for posing the question back. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed learning about today's author and their incredible work. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave us some love with a rating and review. You can find us wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. And of course, Don't forget to buy the book we talked about today. We're on a mission to center and celebrate BIPOC authors, and you can help us do that by sharing this episode and the book. You can join us in our book club to dive deeper into today's book. Visit becomeagoodancestor.com forward slash book club to find out more. For more inspiration and learning, you can find us at becomeagoodancestor.com and become underscore a underscore good underscore ancestor on Instagram. Thank you for being on the journey with us as we strive to become good ancestors in honor of those who have come before us and in service to those who will come after we are gone.